Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, I'm Dr. Durga Sigdar. I'm a consultant pediatrician at Queen's Hospital, and I'm good allergy interest. Today, we're going to talk about food allergy in children. Um, I've divided my talk in two sessions. And the first one, we are going to talk about overview of food allergy. I'll talk a little bit about the history, diagnosis, and management of food allergy. And then at the end, I'll talk about allergy prevention. And the second part of the talk, I'm, I'll be talking about milk allergy. Um, so the way we are planning to run the session is um, when I finish the first part of the presentation, we'll give some time to ask questions. So you can ask me a question either, uh, either with you um, on muting your mute button, or you can put your question in the chat box and Bola will help me to ask the question. I'll try to answer my best. And then second part will be milk allergy. And you again, the same thing we'll do. You can ask me some questions and we'll wrap up the session. To start with, um, is allergy and intolerance. These two terms are interchangeable most of the times, but allergy and intolerance is completely different things. Um, so allergy is immune mediated hypersensitivity reactions. And the key feature of allergy is reproducible. So every time you expose to this food protein or any offending uh, protein component, you will have the same reaction. Um, on the other hand, intolerance is not immune mediated. Um, most of the time is enzymatic. One of the common example is lactose intolerance. And this is again the hypersensitivity reaction. So the key feature is um, allergy is immune mediated and it's always reproducible and intolerance is non-immune mediate. Allergy is two types of allergy, is IgE mediated, where there is IgE antibody in the body, uh, and another is non-IgE mediated. In the next slide, I will talk a little bit more about IgE and non-IgE mediated allergy and how we differentiate it between those two. So IgE is immediate type of allergy and non-IG is a delayed type of allergy. So immediate type means when you're exposed to the food protein, um, the reaction happens immediately. It's most of the time within half an hour, but it can happen within two hours. Whereas in the delayed type of reaction, we don't get immediate type of reaction, but the reaction can happen after hours or even days in up to 72 hours. In Ig mediated type, media type of allergy, the, the reaction is either skin involvement, uh, which could, could be urticaria, angioedema, or pruritus, or if the reaction progress further and turns to be severe type of reaction, there could be organ involvement, uh, like respiratory system, uh, in which the child can present with a cough, difficulty in breathing and wheeze, or there could be cardiovascular involvement, loss in blood pressure, and that can give you the drowsiness and collapse. So if there is a skin involvement plus system involvement, that's um, it's called anaphylaxis. On the other hand, non-IG type of allergy, you do not get immediate type of allergy, but most of the time, either you get skin symptoms, or for example, eczema may be flared up after some time, or predominantly we get GI symptoms. That means reflux, constipation, diarrhea, or a bit of blood in the stool. For IG mediate, mediated allergy is a well-defined mechanism. Um, in what happened when the allergen is exposed in the body, antigen presenting cells uh, present those allergen in the epithelial cell. And there's a complex immune me mechanism happens where T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes play important role. And the B lymphocytes convert themselves in the secretory plasma cell. And when allergen is exposed again, um, this plasma cell produce Ig antibody and reaction happens. And most of the time the reaction happened because of the mast cell degranulation and histamine release in the body, which can give wide range of skin and systemic symptoms. In Non-Ig type of reaction, we don't know exactly how the symptoms occur and the mechanism is not very clear. Ig type of allergy are easy to diagnose. Um, there is usually typical history um, of reaction. And there are some validated tests, for example, skin prick testing and IgE testing where, where we can measure IgE level. On the other hand, non-IgE type of allergy is harder to diagnose. Um, most of the time is based on the history 
and clinical suspicion. And there are lots of times the symptoms can overlap with other conditions, for example, lactose tolerance and other different types of food intolerance, the symptoms overlap. There is no definitive test for non-IG type of allergy. Um, and the key feature of IG type of allergy, as I mentioned earlier, is reproducible. Every time you're exposed with the allergen, we get the same symptoms. But non-IG type of allergy, you do get symptoms, but the threshold can be different. For example, non-IG type of milk allergy, the child may tolerate, tolerate a small amount of milk, but if you get larger amount of milk, the child may not tolerate. So it's threshold dependent at times. What are the common food allergen? Um, we say four main allergen or six main allergen. So the most common food allergen in children are milk, egg, wheat, and soya. We call it a four main allergen. And sometimes we do uh, call six main allergen. So that can extend to peanut and fish. So milk, egg, wheat, soya, nuts, and fish. And there are lots of other um, allergies. For example, tree nuts, um, cashew, pistachio, almond. Selfish is another common allergy. Um, usually you don't see in the very young children because they don't have selfish, but in older children and adults, you do see quite a lot of selfish allergy. The food commonly called delayed type of allergy are milk, egg, wheat, and soya. So milk, egg, wheat, and soya can cause immediate type and delayed type of allergy. And most of the time we do see milk and uh, milk, wheat, and egg causing eczema flare-up and other GI symptoms. Natural history of allergy is changing and we are seeing lots of lots of new allergen. The child can react with any food, uh, but the certain foods are more common as we discussed in the previous slide. Um, but we are seeing more common, more new allergen, especially lentil, chickpea and peas. I have seen this allergy is more common in the Asian children. Um, and we do also see allergy to kiwi and in, in fruits and vegetables and the allergy to kiwi is usually mild and most of the time is, is oral allergy syndromes when the children are sensitized to uh, arrow allergen. And we also, dis, we also do see allergy to sunflower seed, pine, sesame, and any other fruit. If you look in other parts of the world, um, there are different food makers allergy, especially there's interesting fact, oh, of course, I lost it. You're still here with us. I lost a slide from my computer. I don't know what happened, but let me just bring it. Have you got it back? No, no, I, I got it back. Sorry. Okay. Got you can see, isn't it? Can you see? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yes, we can see. Um, for example, it's interesting in Japan, they, there's allergy to bird's nest. Apparently, they make a soup from the bird's nest and drink it. So we... I talked earlier briefly about signs and symptoms of food allergies. So the immediate or IG type of allergy, you predominantly get the skin symptoms, which can be pruritis, urticaria, rash, or angioedema. And then you get a systemic symptoms, uh, for example, respiratory symptoms, rhinitis, sneezing, itchy eyes, cough, with difficulty in bathing. So, and in gastrointestinal system, like vomiting. Um, and if, if you have a cardiovascular involvement and blood pressure drops down, uh, the child may be drowsy and loss of consciousness. So if there's involvement with skin symptoms plus systemic symptoms, the respiratory cardiovascular symptoms, that is classified as anaphylaxis. In delayed type of food allergy is most of the time is skin symptoms. It's generally eczema flare-up and the wide range of gastrointestinal symptoms, which ranges from diarrhea to vomiting, reflux, um, food aversion, bloating of abdomen, abdominal distension, abdominal pain, and child may be present with inconsolable cry. And if we leave the children with exposing to the food allergen, which they are reacting, and the children may present with faltering growth. And then some children uh, may present with the food aversion as well. How common is food allergy? Um, if you look different studies, population-based studies, uh, they report slightly different. Um, so generally, the prevalence of food allergy around 5% in the UK. Um, this is a paper from the last from Michael, Michael, Michael Perkins in 2016, who found that 7.1% food allergy in the breastfed and infant, and 1 in 40, that is 2.5% to peanut, and 1 in 20, that is 5% to egg. Um, but roughly, the prevalence of food allergy is 5%. 
but that is a true allergy but you may have noticed as well lots of people self report their symptoms and they self diagnose that allergy to food and in generally around 20% um, people they report that they are allergic to food um, but they are not actually the true incidence of food allergy is at around 5% but the self reported symptoms can you can see in around 20% people that is one in five but they are not true allergy how do you diagnose food allergy for any disease the history is the most important and then support your history um, then you request a diagnostic test exactly same thing applies in allergy um, so you diagnose with the history and history is even more important the typical history you you ask when you taking um, when seeing a child with allergy the first thing is when the allergy started when the child was exposed to the food when the first time child is exposed to the food and the child start reacting or it happened in the subsequent exposure sometimes the child may not react in the first exposure if the child has not been sensitized with that food but if the child is already sensitized to that food protein then the child may react with the first exposure um as you know the sensitization can occur from the skin route especially children with with the eczema so they may not have eaten that food before but they may be sensitized with the skin route or or in the respiratory epithelium and it is also important that what was the amount of food child was taken before child reacted if the child reacted with a very very small amount of food or trace amount of food the chance of child having the severe reaction is high but if the child is reacted with a large amount of food it may not be the severe type of allergy so in what exposure is the first exposure or subsequent exposure the amount of food is important and the other thing other important thing is how long after exposure to food the child started to react so that will help you to distinguish whether immediate type of reaction or delayed type of reaction that means whether i is ig immediate or non ig immediate in ig immediate reaction the reaction happen immediately uh, within within 30 minutes so sometimes it can be within 2 hours non ig type of allergy it can happen later and what is the type of reaction if there is urticaria angioedema um, or any systemic involvement respiratory gi tract or cardiovascular then it's more likely to be ig type of allergy but if it is a delayed type of reaction for example it's if the child started to vomiting child is constipation or eczema getting worse then it is a delayed type of reaction um so these things will help you to determine what is the type of allergy and if the child is allergic to food or not and then once you establish, establish this in history then you order the investigation um in allergy there are only mainly um two investigation we do one is skin prick testing and another is specific IgA if you have got the capacity um on expertise to the skin prick testing it is a much easier and it is most commonly used uh, diagnostic tool, tool for the allergy um it's easy to carry out usually done in the forearm uh, as you can see in this picture and sometimes it can be difficult for example if the child has um extensive eczema uh, on the forearm forearm you may not be able to do it but you can do it at the back as well so you, any part of the skin in the body you can do skin prick testing um in skin prick testing um you do as a positive control and negative control in positive control we give histamine as you can see in this picture here in the histamine there is is this a will is forming and negative control is a saline drop so it child should not be react with the saline that's a negative control and then um you inject in epidermis the allergen extract you can do multiple allergy testing at the same time um 10 to well whatever number you can use the both arm um once you inject the allergen you wait for another 15 minutes and read read it read mainly the wheel diameter if the wheel diameter is 3 mm or more it is considered as a positive result is less than 3 mm is a negative result so is a quick um and then you can get the result immediately and discuss the finding with the family at the same time um there are certain circumstances you cannot do skin prick testing uh, especially if the child has taken antihistamine uh, it's a long acting antihistamine for example cetrizine child should not be taking for more than 5 days and the short acting antihistamine for example chlorpheniramine or pyridone child should not have taken for the 72 hours otherwise the test result will not be valid 
And the second test we do commonly, and probably you, you must have done it many times, is a specific IgE um, in which we measure a specific IgE against that food protein in the blood. Um, a specific IgG is not easy to do. The child needs to blood test and it's always not easy to do the blood test in the children. Um, you can do multiple tests at the same time. Um, and a specific IgG is more expensive than the skin prick testing. For the one specific IgE to particular food allergen, for example, peanut, um, it costs around 11, 12 pounds, but skin prick testing is much cheaper. Um, in so certain circumstances, you may not be able to do skin prick testing. As I mentioned earlier, if you've got the skin, um, there's no area in the skin, you can do skin prick testing. Uh, in that case, you can do a specific IgE. Or if the child has a severe um, allergic rhinitis or other symptoms and the child cannot stop antihistamine for the skin prick testing for four to five days, and in that case, you can order a specific IgE. Mm -hmm. Um, the, for the specific IgE, 0 0.35 uh, kilo intentional unit per liter is a cutoff. If the result is above 0 0.35, it is considered as a positive result and less than 0 0.35 considered as a negative result. Um, and there are other tested, for example, component testing is, is coming more frequently in the use now. We do in secondary and tertiary care. Um, in component testing, you can test individual protein component of the food. Um, in lots of time, you may have a positive skin prick test or a skin a specific IgE due to sensitization, uh, but that may not show the true positive result. In that case, you can um, request component testing and test a specific protein component of the food. For example, um, in peanut, um, a specific protein component is called ARA, yes, due, after the Latin name. So there are ARA2, ARA6, ARA8. So if you do ARA2 positive, and um, that means it's specific to peanut, but ARA8 um, may be sensitized. So if the child has an ARA2 positive, um, but ARA8 negative, then it is allergy to peanut, but ARA2 is negative, but RAS is positive, that is likely to be sensitization. It is really helps you when you're thinking about putting a child in food silence to make that decision. Um, there are other tests coming, emerging tests, it's called BAT and MAT. It's a BAT is based on activation test, and MAT stands for um, mast cell activation test. In the UK, these tests are not done in clinical practice at the moment. They are mainly in the research base. I think in the US, they do in some centers, but it's not in the clinical practice yet. Um, the gold standard for to diagnose the food allergy is a double blind placebo controlled food silence. Um, that is the only way you can confirm that the whether the child is positive or not. So in that case, the child does not know which food child is having. For example, if you're suspecting milk allergy on the child, you give milk containing food to the child and see whether the child will react or not. Um, if the child react, then the child is allergic. If the child does not react, then the child is not allergic. So in that case, you can forget the test result. If the test result is positive, but the child does not react with that particular food protein, and that means child is not allergic to that food. Um, so just to mention, in around 50% of the case in allergy, uh, you do get false positive result. The test result may be positive. The child may have a specific IgE in the blood. Um, that means due to sensitization and not necessarily child will react with that food protein. Few important points about allergy testing. So once you take the history and then you test the suspected allergen. So if you if there's a clear history of milk allergy, child was exposed to milk protein and child started to react, then you think that child may have um, child likely to have milk allergy. And just to confirm your diagnosis and to see um, the level of allergy, you request for a specific IgI skin prick testing. Never uh, request any test. Um, if the child is already tolerating the food. For example, child is already having milk in the, in the diet and the parents ask you to do the allergy testing to milk, don't request that test. Um, because the child, the test may be positive in that case um, because the sensitization, but the child is already having milk. So that means child is not allergic to that food. And what happens sometimes the allergy tests are done uh, um, despite the child is tolerating that food in their diet. Um, and then you go and explain to the parent, look, your test result is positive, but the child is not allergic. That usually confuses parents. And I spend sometimes quite a lot of time to explaining to the parents in my clinic, look, um, although the test result is positive, but your, your child is not allergic. And sometimes this conversation can be difficult. 
and the parents might think that oh test result is positive my child is allergic and they might stop that food giving to the child and what that lead to at the end of the day is the child may lose tolerance and after a few months or few years child may be truly allergic so we should not do uh, allergy testing the child is already tolerating food in certain circumstances we do um, allergy testing um, if the child is still eating the food um, that is one of the typical example is eczema especially in the young baby the food may be the problem uh, for the eczema flare up so in that case we request the specific ig to common food like milk egg and wheat to see uh, the level of specific ige and whether we should take the food out from the child diets until a few months to make the eczema better and we can reintroduce the food later when the eczema control is good um, so lots of the time when you do specific IGA skin prick testing, the test result may be positive, which is due to cross sensitization, not due to cross reactivity. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, on the 50% of the time, sometimes the test result may be positive, but um, there may not be any allergy. So this table, we usually um, help us to determine when you put the child in for the food challenge. Um, so there are different food, for example, if I take the typical example of milk in more than two year old child, um, if the skin prick test will diameter is eight millimeter or specific IgE is 15 and this child has a 90% chance that uh, be positive to milk allergy. Uh, but look the number, um, what we consider is skin prick test will diameter three millimeter or more is considered as a positive result, but is this child right. This child has a will diameter of eight millimeter or a specific, a specific IG 0.35 um, kilo international unit per liter or more is considered positive, but this child has a, um, a specific IG 15. In that, still this child has a 95% chance of having allergy. So this helps us to guide uh, us to determine whether we put the child in the um, uh, food challenge or not. A little bit about atopic mask. Um, atopic mask talks about um, natural history of allergic disease. Um, so what happened in the allergy, allergic comorbidities? Um, the more, main four types of allergic comorbidities are food allergy, asthma, eczema, and rhinitis. Um, if you look in this graph, um, the horizontal line or X axis is the A's, and the vertical line uh, or Y axis is the incidence of allergy of that particular condition. If I take the example of eczema, the blue line, you must you have seen that the eczema is quite common in the babies, uh, especially one to two years of age, and they might have a mild eczema, a bit of pruritis, dry skin, or hair in their eczema patches. Um, and the incidence of eczema is rises in the first uh, two, three years of life, as you can see the graph is going up. Uh, and the incidence will, will gradually come down. Most of the children with the eczema gets better after two, three years. And the eczema gradually get better and in some people it persists in the life. Similarly, another example is the food allergy. In the red line here, the food allergy incidence goes up in two, three years. Um, and then it gradually come down and persists in, persist in lower level and later in the life. It is mainly due to the milk and egg allergy. As you can see that milk and egg, most of the children with the milk and egg allergy, they grow out of it. Um, but some children may develop with the nut allergy and other food, um, and their, their food allergy persists later in the life. The other example, you can look asthma in, in green line here. Um, the incidence of asthma or viral induced waste in increases in the first four or five years of life. And we do see many children with a viral induced waste, and but these children will grow out of their viral induced waste when they start their school or five, six years of age. But some children will persist with symptoms later in the life and develop asthma. On the other hand, um, if you look at allergic rhinitis, and the allergic rhinitis symptoms you do not see in the children in the first four or five years of age. Um, because they don't get sensitized in the first few years of life. Once they start get sensitized, and they start showing the sign of allergic rhinitis. And the allergic rhinitis, as you see in this orange graph, um, the incidence will go up in later childhood, adolescence period, and in, ad in adulthood and persist. And allergic rhinitis symptoms persisted throughout the life. So what does it tell us is, most of the allergy, eczema, uh, food allergy, and viral induced waste, children grow out of it and 
and grow out of this allergy, but allergy rhinitis, it persisted later in life. Um, so I'm going to talk about beta management, overall management of food allergy. There are, there are many guidelines uh, for the food allergy management. Uh, different allergy academy has produced different uh, allergy guidelines. You may have your own guidelines in the primary, primary care. Um, in secondary care and tertiary care, we use BSACI, which is the British Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. It produces many guidelines, and BSACI guidelines are very useful. Um, there's another European version called IACI. Um, there's a old, old allergy organization, so they, they produce different guidelines. Um, how do we manage uh, allergy, food allergy especially? Um, once you confirm the food allergy from from the history and from your skin prick testing or um, specific IgE. And then the first thing you do is you avoid the allergy, uh, allergen. Um, so whatever child is allergic to any food protein, you avoid that allergen. Um, you advise parents not to give that food protein. For example, if the child is uh, reacting to milk and then you try to, you take the milk out of the diet. Um, but most of the children are allergic to milk, uh, egg and wheat. And we have to be very careful when we take the food out from their diet because the milk, egg, wheat, and that very common major food. And when you advise to take these foods out from the diet, and that may have a negative impact in nutrition. I usually involve dietitian very early for the management of food allergy. So um, we see children in the clinic, we have a 15, 20 minute slot. Even in primary care, you have got a 10 minute slot. We, we won't have enough time to go through the history and make a diagnosis and explain to the parents and go through the food. So the dietitian are very, very useful um, to go through the parents, uh, how much the child is taking, how much the calorie requirement, and to advise on the food alternative. For example, if the, if the child is, you are avoiding cow's milk from the child diets, um, then what are the other milk alternatives you, you can give? And, and we also be, have to be very careful. For example, if you're taking a milk out from the diet, uh, milk is a good source of calcium. So, and calcium is very important for the growth of the children. And when you give in the, another milk substitute, make sure it is um, fortified, contain enough calcium for the child to grow. And, and these things can be discussed with the dietetic appointment. And the second thing is um, we need to manage with the acute reaction. Um, if the child is reacting with that food protein and the, the child may have accidental exposure to food uh, when they go to a restaurant, to school or other places. And if they have an accidental exposure to food and how do the parents manage this acute reaction? For mild to moderate reaction, um, for example, beta pruritis, urticaria or angioedema can be managed with the antihistamine. Um, I usually prefer cetirizine compared to other antihistamines. So we have a two types of antihistamine. One is a sedating antihistamine, another is a non-sedating, and one is short-acting, and another is long-acting. So I prefer cetirizine uh, because cetirizine is a non-sedating and half-life is 12 hours, so it lasts longer. Uh, you can use other antihistamine uh, of your choice, or if you've got if you got a particular guidelines in primary care, for example, lor uh, loratidine um, and fexofenadine. Um, this other antihistamine is commonly used is chlorophenidamine or periton. I won't suggest to give uh, chlorophenidamine to school-going children. If you give chlorophenidamine in the morning, child goes to school, might be drowsy or sleep in the classroom. So in that case, I usually prefer non-sedating antihistamines. Um, so I usually give a prescription of cetirizine, um, but this cetirizine or chlorophenidamine can be bought over the counter as well. Um, for the younger babies, especially babies, you can give chlorophenidamine, which the half-life is four hours and sedative. For the babies, it, it, will, it can be good for sleeping as well. Um, if there's a history of severe allergic reaction uh, slash anaphylaxis, then we have to prescribe EpiPen. Uh, I'll come a little bit more detail on that next slide or so. Um, and we'll prescribe these children with EpiPen or adrenaline auto-injector. So when you diagnose food allergy, um, we, I al always give allergy action plan. I'll discuss that a little bit more in my next slide. Um, there are allergy action plan in BSACI website. If you just Google it, BSACI allergy action plan, you can get this plan. And it's very useful for the family to understand um, what their child is allergic to and what they have to do if the child has allergic to action. And we discussed about the nutritional, nutritional support and it's very important to involve the dietitian and early. 
And we tend to follow up these children in our allergy clinic and we see them in every six months or every year and where we go through the history if they have any um, accidental exposure and we repeat their skin pre-testing or a specific IgE and see whether there's allergy, they are growing out, their, out of their allergy and whether we can do the, we can challenge them. Um, whether silence can be done at home or we have to do hospital silence. Because most of the children with the food allergy, especially milk and egg, they grow out of allergy. And unless we challenge them with the food and you don't know whether they grow out of, grow, growing out of the allergy or not. In some stages, we need to challenge them. That will be determined by the history uh, and, and, and the skin pre-testing or specific Ig result. So this is allergy action plan. I briefly talked previously. Um, this is the screenshot from the BSACI website. Um, it is in the PDF format. Um, there are two uh, allergy action plan, as you can see here. The left hand side is um, the allergy action plan with um, EpiPen. So, and the right hand side, this one is allergy action plan without EpiPen. Um, so it's easy, you can go to the BSACI website and type BSACI, um, um, the BSACI allergy action plan and you can get this allergy action plan um, or you can print some of the copies and handwritten as well. So most of the time it's a drop down menu and you can get it. So you, you write down in the top what the child is allergic to, put the name, the date of birth. And this is very really good. It will explain to where the child has a mild to moderate reaction. For example, in what are the mild and moderate reaction and what you do if the child has a mild and moderate reaction. And it also explains um, what are the signs of anaphylaxis and what to do in, with the, if the child has anaphylaxis. And it also mentions the dose of um, EpiPen here. And you can put the parent's detail, their phone number and sign it. On the right hand side, um, you can see um, the allergy action plan without EpiPen and it, it explains to the parents if there's a sign of anaphylaxis, what to do and to call 9999. So if you diagnose allergic, um, allergy in the food allergy in the children, please print out this allergy action plan and give, give it to the parents. They can copy it and they can give it to the nursery, they can give it to the school. And so school and nursery also know what the child is allergic to and what to do if there's allergic reaction. And the important question is, you might have experienced many times in your practice who need EpiPen or adrenaline auto injector. There's a guidelines from BSACI, which we follow in secondary care. And I'll go through in, in the next slide. Uh, about The most important thing is, who do you give an EpiPen or adrenaline auto injector? Um, the first thing is, if there's anaphylaxis. If there's anaphylaxis, history of anaphylaxis, yes, we do, we do prescribe EpiPen. However, if there's a history of anaphylaxis, but that is avoidable. For example, child reacted with a parental drug, had an anaphylactic reaction with a parental drug, and parental drug is easily avoidable. They can lock the drug uh, away from the child. In that case, the child may not need EpiPen. Uh, we don't prescribe EpiPen. For example, child went from exotic holidays and had some mushroom or some other food and child reacted to that food and we can easily avoid it in this country, then you don't need. Um, and if there's a clear history of anaphylaxis and you can't avoid this food, for example, common food, allergen milk, egg, wheat, or peanut, and these are easily available food protein and the child can have accidental exposure, then we prescribe EpiPen. And, the, and then the second thing comes to the gray area. So the child does not have history of anaphylaxis, but the mild and moderate reaction. And what you do in that case? So in that case, we need to do the risk stratification. And that is mainly determined by whether the child has got asthma or wheeze. If child has a mild to moderate reaction, but the child has got asthma or wheeze, and they are already got a hyperreactive airway, in that case, we do prescribe EpiPen. Uh, but if the child has a mild to moderate reaction, but there's no history of asthma, or there's no history of reaction with the trace amount, then we tend to not to prescribe EpiPen. In that case, we advise parents to give histamine, uh, sorry, antihistamine when they have an allergic reaction. So just to summarize, if there is a history of anaphylaxis, we do give prescribed EpiPen. If there's no history of anaphylaxis, we need to do the risk assessment. Um, and if the child has a history of asthma or viral in this ways, yes, we prescribe EpiPen. If there's no, then we advise to give to parents antihistamine. So please go through, um, through this flow sheet and it's, it's very useful and self-explanatory. I always go 
um, through this flow sheet when I decide whether to prescribe EpiPen or not. Um, so adrenaline auto injector EpiPen, the dose is either is age-based or is a weight-based. Um, in less than five years, we give 150 microgram. Uh, six to 11 years, 300 microgram, and above 12 years is 500 microgram. The other way you can do by weight, less than 25 kilogram, you can give 150 microgram, and above 25 kilo, you can give one, three, sorry, 300 microgram. Um, how many EpiPen? Um, this question is asked very frequently, um, but the bottom line is child should have access to two EpiPen all the time. In my in my practice, I usually prescribe two EpiPen when I prescribe, when I give him, um, them EpiPen. Um, the reason we prescribe two is sometimes the child may need two or the one EpiPen may not work or it fail to file. Um, we usually advise parents if they have to use EpiPen, use the EpiPen and call 999 as an emergency and the 99 um, parameter screw will attend very quickly. Um, I usually advise parents um, to keep the EpiPen with them all the time and put in the piggy, piggy bag. If the child goes to school, it can easily be kept in the school bag. Um, there's a MS, MSRA guidelines came in 2017, which advised the clinician to prescribe two EpiPen, but I'll leave that decision to you. It all, lots of things depends upon your local practice and your local guidelines as well. But, but the child should have access to two EpiPen all the time. Um, there is a legislation came in October 2017. After that, school can stock EpiPen or adrenaline auto injector at school. So nowadays, most of the school keep EpiPen in the school and they can use if the child is showing sign of anaphylaxis at the school. So that's all. another reason your allergy action plan is very important so that the school also know uh, if the child is an EpiPen or not and what the child is allergic to. Um, what are the Available product in the market. Uh, there are two products at the moment. Is EpiPen is has been there for many years and is commonly used. And there's another product is Zext. They are similar. Um, they come in two strength. EpiPen comes in 150 microgram and 300 microgram, as same as Zext. And they're um, these are expensive. I think one pen cost around 45 pound, and they're expiry date is around 18 months and most of the time children may not use the epipen but it's important to have this um adrenaline auto injector if there's a history of anaphylaxis you never know and you have may have heard in the news that um death due to anaphylaxis is not common but it can happen so this is the way we can prevent death from anaphylaxis there used to be another product called Emirate, um, which has been taken from the market one and a half years ago because there's some problem. It was not firing on the medicine. The benefit of Emirate against this uh, EpiPen and Zex that it comes in three strength, 150 microgram, 300 microgram, and 500 microgram. And Emirate has a longer needle. So especially the big children or OB children, you can give it. Um, emitted, which has longer needle, but it's not available in the market at the moment, but it might come. The other most important thing is once you prescribe EpiPen, your roles and responsibility does not end here. You must train the parents uh, how to use EpiPen. If we give the prescription and they don't know how to use it, no point it. And they need to know um, when to give EpiPen. You can explain to them and give an allergy action plan, and you must show them uh, how to use it. Um, in secondary care, if uh, most of the time it is done by the allergy CNS, in primary care, if you go to the practice nurse which, which, who can train the family, they can train as well. But it is important that you train them. Uh, if you ask the manufacturer, they can give you lots of dummy and you can use in your drawer in, in your clinic and you can show it to the parents. It doesn't take long. It literally takes one to two minutes. And I usually advise parents to watch video when they go home. There are lots of video they can find in online, uh, this in YouTube, or if you go to manufacturer website and EpiPen and Zext website, there are videos and they can learn. And when these children come to our clinic uh, in early basis, we take that opportunity to give a refresher training to them as well. Um, so training is very, very important. I have a child um, in emergency department, the parents gave EpiPen um, when the child has febrile convulsion. They, they did not know when to give EpiPen. So it's quite important to teach them when to give and how to give adrenaline auto injector. Um, this is just for the information. Um, these are the 14 foods um, which should be highlighted 
in, in the food product. If you go to the supermarket and see the food packaging, you see some of the fruits are bold um, or highlighted. And these are the 14 allergens, which are common allergens. This is the UK and EU law. It's come around 2013, 2014, and manufacturer must highlight these foods in their packaging. Um, so we talked about the allergy history, diagnosis, and management. Um, and the prevalence and, and incidence of prevalence of allergy is rising. And the next question comes, can we prevent allergy? The answer is yes. So I'm going to show you evidence in the next few slides based on these two studies uh, done in, in, in the UK in, within the last decade. Um, so the one study is called LIP study. Um, it stands for learning early about peanut. Um, so I'll just briefly um, tell you what these studies showed. So what LEAP study showed is, and there were 640 children was enrolled in the studies, is a randomized controlled trial study. Um, and they were either had eczema or egg allergy or both, and whether and some children were sensitized with this peanut, 530 children were sensitized, and there's another group of children who were not sensitized to peanut. And these children were given peanut protein two to three times a week until they are five years of age. Um, so they are randomized two group. One group continued to get a peanut protein until five years, and another group of children did not get peanut protein until they are five years of age. Um, so what did it show in five years? Those children who are avoiding peanut, um, the incidence of peanut allergy is much higher compared to the children who are having peanut. So if you can see here in consumption group, um, the, um, the incidence of peanut allergy at five years of age is 3%. Uh, but in avoidance group is 17.2 percent is more than five times higher incidence of peanut allergy in avoidance group um, similarly there was another study which is called et study inquiring about tolerance um, there are more than thousand children were enrolled in this group and what they looked um, in et study is if you introduce allergenic food in children diet early what happens so children were randomized in two group um, um, to give food, they were given allergenic food early from four, from three months on, onward. Six food were given milk, peanut, egg, sesame, white fish, and wheat. And there's another group of children who were not given these allergenic food until six months, which is standard practice. And, and they looked in the incidence of food allergy in these children in one to three years, three years of age. And the finding was those children who were given this allergenic food early, um, from three months onwards, the incidence of allergy to peanut and egg was much lower um, compared to the children who were given this allergenic food after six months. But however, there's no difference with the other four foods which were given in this study. Um, so what these studies tell us is um, early food introduction is the key thing to prevent the food allergy. So early introduction of peanut and egg how to prevent development of food allergy in children. So previously the advice used to be don't not to introduce allergenic food, especially the nuts until child is one to two years of age. Now the advice is changed. So we advise to parents to introduce allergenic food, not an egg from early when they start weaning. The standard weaning time in the UK is four to six months. The parents will decide when they want to wean the child. And when they start weaning, we advise the parents to start giving allergenic food early. So these two studies showed that um, early introduction food is safe. It doesn't have negative impact in child nutrition and we can prevent the developing allergy to these children early. So when you see these uh, children or parents in your primary care, please advise them to introduce allergenic food early. And, and the lots of guidelines has been changed now and we advise to introduce allergenic food early in the diet. So that's the only way we can prevent allergy now. So there's no other way um, we have prevented this allergy. Um, this question may have been asked you many times. Um, what you do, are the siblings of child with food allergy at higher risk of allergy? So maybe the sibling has a milk allergy and the parents may come to your clinic um, to ask you to prescribe the hypoallergenic food uh, and asking for whether there's other younger child is allergic to milk or not. Um, but the evidence has shows that if the sibling has got the food allergy, it doesn't increase the risk of food allergy in, in the sibling. Um, so the current advice is if the sibling has a food allergy, we don't 
take a special precaution. What we advise families is to introduce food early in their diet as we advise to the other children. But the important thing is child, if the families need to make a plan how to introduce that food into the child's diet. Um, because the, if, the, if, the, if the child in the family has peanut allergy, that, fa that family may be the not free family. So they, they may not um, buy food, buy peanut in, in house. So in that case, family needs to make a plan to introduce the peanut in the other child, keeping the safe the child who is allergic to peanuts. So they need to plan. But the advice is you can introduce these foods early. So um, that is the first part of my presentation, um, uh, this overview of food allergy. The second part is uh, the milk allergy. Unfortunately, I'm just looking at the time is already 51 past six. So I'm really sorry, I'm just overly running out of time. Uh, but whatever it is, um, we can take a break and you can ask me the questions now. Okay, we've got three questions here for you. And yeah. one of the questions says, I understand we should not be prescribing extra EpiPens for schools and only required amount to be carried out with child at all times rather than kept in the school office. Please advise. Thanks. Um, so it's a guideline. So previously, what we uh, the advice was to there's a tendency to prescribe four epipen, uh, two for the home, two for the school, um, and most of the time children do not use epipen. Uh, it's very rare, um, and then what happens? The, the epipen expires in eighteen months and is 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 forty forty five pounds. So that's why the, the the practice has changed now. So school can keep the epipen at school, um, and if the child has anaphylaxis reaction in school, they can use. Um, but usually what we can advise is we can prescribe two EpiPen and the child uh, can take that EpiPen with them in the piggy bag and the school bag. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The other question I have is, um, in my previous practice, I came across multiple cases where their parents wanted their child to be tested for allergies with ongoing eczema, asthma symptoms where the issue was not very obvious and the trigger could not be easily identified. The policy in that practice was that we should not be requesting allergy tests, but refer to secondary care, secondary care allergy for this. What is your approach to this? Are you happy to receive referrals for allergy testing with no HX of anaphylaxis? That is more straightforward or yeah. What approach would you recommend to GPs? Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a very important question. Um, so the, the answer is, it depends on your expertise. Um, if you are happy to request the test and happy to interpret the result and advise the parents, you can, you can request specific IgE. Uh, but we have to be very careful when you're requesting the specific IgE because uh, the child may not be allergic to it. Uh, and the test result may become back positive, as I mentioned, as I highlighted earlier. Um, and most of the time, children with the eczema, they can be sensitized with the lots of food allergy, food protein, and they may not be truly allergic. And in very young children, it is, especially in the babies, uh, the food may be the culprit uh, for the eczema flare up. So in that case, um, to control the eczema, if it is a very severe, we request a specific IgM to see. Uh, but if there's no clear history, uh, if the parents are coming to ask to request for a specific IG, then if there's no history, then I would not request. Um, in that case, if you want to refer the child to the secondary care, we are more than happy to accept that referral and have a look in the child and, and decide whether the child needs to be tested and discuss discussion to have it with the parents. So the, the answer is yes, um, you not to have this allergy testing and refer to us and we are happy to go through it. But but if the child is already tolerating food and there's no history of allergic reaction and the parents will come and ask for the allergy testing, please don't do it. Um, because that will confuse lots of things. Um, but if you want to refer for the second opinion, we are more than happy to accept those referrals. Thank you very much. Do, do we have, do anyone have any questions they would like to ask? If you do, please unmute yourself and ask that question. Anyone that has any question? 
Please, this Hi, um, I, uh, this is uh, one of the GPs from Redbridge. I do have a Hello. question similar to uh, what just been answered, but a bit more specific to the point that I come across a lot of um, parents who mm. would say that their children are showing some symptoms mm. to certain foods. Say, for example, they started weaning and they've noticed uh, they're, they're, they're having some, nothing serious, but some reaction to strawberries or things like that. Hmm. Is that a direct referral or what, what do we do in that case? It's a minor reaction. There has been no report of anaphylaxis and, and the child is well. Um, what, what would be our approach in that kind of a situation? Um, so it depends upon the food, um, what the child is allergic to. For example, if it is a major food, um, milk, egg, wheat and other foods, then probably that is important. That can have an impact on the nutrition. Uh, but if the child has a very mild reaction with the fruits, for example, you mentioned with the strawberry um, and the reaction to vegetables and, and fruits are usually the mild and it's a single food allergy and it has not a massive impact on the child nutrition, then probably you can manage the child in the primary care with, with the allergy action plan or advising parents how to manage the allergy. So basically for these mild symptoms, um, you can manage with the antihistamine as and when requires. Um, but if there's a history of allergy with the major food allergen, for example, milk, uh, wheat and egg, um, and then the child is showing the sign and symptoms, then probably you can refer the child with, with the dietitian and, and the first if the one approves, and you can refer to us as well if it is a major food, and we're happy to see this child. Um, but for, for the minor reaction, um, not a major food allergen, then probably you can manage in the primary care. For example, if the child come to my clinic um, with the strawberry allergy or the kiwi allergy with the oral allergy syndrome, Basically, what I do is I don't do usually testing. I just um, educate parents, explain about their allergy and how to manage the allergy for the mild allergy symptoms. And many children with the mild symptoms can grow out of it. The other important thing about the food allergy I didn't mention earlier, um, when you advise parents to introduce an allergenic food with the milk, egg, and wheat, and soya, especially when they're winning, the important advice you give is um, just introduce one food at a time. Um, I have seen that uh, lots of times, especially in the not allergy, the parents give the first time mixed knot, um, which may contain peanut, cashew, or almond, and the child reacts. And you don't know whether the child is reacting with the peanut, cashew, or, or almond, so because the child was having mixed knot. Um, the important advice is to advise parents to give introduce one food at a time. Um, and the other important thing is when the child is well, and never as parents should not introduce any allergenic food in their, in their diet when the child is unwell with the viral illness. Um, as you know, uh, the most common cause of rashes in children is a viral illness. Lots of and children do get lots of viral illness, especially in the winter months, and they get rashes. If the child having allergic sorry, having viral illness and the parents give the food, allergenic food, and the child develops rashes, you don't know whether it's due to the viral illness, viral rash, or it's a true allergic rash. So it's quite important to uh, tell the parents that introduce one food at a time. Um, and the second thing is do when the child is well. And there's no rush. They can they can introduce one food at a time. For example, if they are winning uh, on the egg, is to give egg a small amount first. So they can start with a small amount and gradually build up. Um, and the other important advice of introducing food is um, baked product are less allergenic than the fresh product. So what happens when you cook food? Um, the the epitope, uh, protein epitope, is usually protein is allergic. The epitope, the structure of the protein changes when you cook food um, and it becomes less allergenic. So when you advise parents to introduce egg, I usually advise to give them to baked product for first. For example, you get cake uh, or well-cooked um, omelet or well-cooked scrambled egg. And if you cook them longer, it becomes less allergenic. So you always start with the baked product uh, and then gradually go to less product. So that, that will be the another advice. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the milk in, in my next presentation. I hope that answers your question. That does. Thank you very much. Sorry, just um, what you said based on that, uh, one very quick question as well, about the oral allergy syndrome. Yes. Um, what should be the advice? Because I, I have come across a couple of patients who mentioned that. So is it they totally avoid it? Or can, can they also have it in a, like a slightly cooked or, or, or washed or what do we do? 
So the answer is second part you mentioned. So oral allergy syndrome, if you look for the pathophysiology of oral allergy syndrome, is, is mostly due, due to the sensitization with the pollen. And you do get most of the time oral allergy syndrome with the fruits and vegetables. So the kiwi is the most common I've seen in my practice, and the others are like apple. Um, what do you see in the children is the children that also uh, has a sensitization with the arrow allergen. So they have allergic rhinitis symptoms. And due to the cross sensitization, um, these children uh, exhibit the sign of allergy when they have these fruits and vegetables, especially kiwi and apple. Um, the advice I usually give it, um, they can peel the skin off um, and that can make the less allergenic. And also they can boil the fruit. Uh, or warm the food in the microwave for, for 30 seconds or one minute, and that makes the food less allergenic. And, and they can continue to eat this food. So they can take this measure, taking the skin off, boiling the food, or they can also have this processed food. For example, if, if, you, if the child is showing the oral allergy syndrome to apple, fresh apple, and what if the child is having canned apple, then the child may not be reacting to this one. And it is very common to the fresh fruits. Um, as long as they can tolerate the symptoms, they can continue to have it. They, 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 should not, they do not necessarily need to avoid it. It's, it's the individual choice. For example, I personally get oral allergy syndrome with the kiwi, but I continue to eat. So as long as they can tolerate, um, they can continue to eat the food. Um, and in oral allergy syndrome, the reaction usually does not progress further and you don't see an anaphylaxis type of reaction with oral allergy syndrome. Yes, they can continue to eat the food as long as they tolerate. Thank you very much. One question, please. Uh, this uh, injection, Epipen, until now, we used to use only 150 and 300, depending on the age. But is it everybody over 12, you recommend now 500 microns? So, so, so that's a very good question. The recommended dose for the adult and children above 12 years is 500 uh, microgram, but we don't have that product available in the market at the moment. We used to have Emirate, but it's taken off from the market one and a half years ago. And the current practice is um, above 12 years, we give the 300 micro, three, sorry, 300 micro, sorry, after six years, we give the 300 microgram, or even after 12 years in adult population also, we give above 300 microgram. But the advice you can give, if they use the one EpiPen, uh, 300 microgram in the older children, and they are still having the symptoms after five minutes, they can give the another EpiPen. Uh, but um, we don't have the product, and the advice is just to give 300 microgram first and Thank safe. you, thank you so much. Excellent. We've got one last question and uh, we'll wrap it up. Is it possible for minor reactions after multiple exposure? It leads to severe anaphylaxis. Um, so it could happen. Uh, so what would happen is um, if you expose with the food protein for the first time and the child may not be sensitized with that food. So in multiple sensitization, um, the child may react further. And the other, other instance is Initially, if you get a small amount of food and if you get if you increase the amount of food, the reaction may progress further. So that is why it is important. So it can happen. Um, that is why we just need to tell the parents and make them aware and so that they can recognize the sign of severe symptoms. Um, so, but if there's a history of mild reaction of the child is reacting to the food, we advise not to have that food and continue manage with, with the antihistamine. So that's how it exactly happens. So if the child has a mild reaction, the the parents can give uh, antihistamine first. And if they see any sign of anaphylaxis, um, as part in the allergy action plan, any respiratory or cardiovascular involvement, that, and they will give EpiPen. So in most of the times, in the first instances, if there may not be anaphylaxis reaction and they can give antihistamine first, but if there's a sign and symptoms of anaphylaxis, then they can give EpiPen. Thank you very much. Um, I think what we'll be looking at, I think we'll be calling it a day. We've, I know we've run out of time. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for attending today's session. I hope you find it useful and beneficial. If you've got any further questions, um, um, you can send me and you can send those questions to me and I'll be more than happy to pass it on to um, the consultant and he'll be able to answer those questions for you for you are you happy for me to share your email address with the um, delegates who are uh, attending the session today or not 
yes, I, I'll be very happy. So you can email me if you've got any questions. So I'll, I'll try to answer my best. And okay. apologies, and it, it meant to be two sessions uh, for milk allergy. I thought which will be very important for the primary care, but uh, sorry, I could not finish it. Uh, it's been already five past seven. So you oh. may have other commitment, but I have got the presentation ready and I'll be happy to do that presentation the next time when you have time. So just do let okay. me know. Uh, and then we can add in another session so okay. I, can do, I can do the milk allergy. Okay, what I will do is because I've got the dates planned all out anyway. So what I will do is I'll look at the next date we have for the pediatric one and we would we will put that as the milk uh, for the milk allergy session. So I'll liaise with you. What will happen today is I will the presentation, the first part of the presentation, I will copy that and send that all to the delegates. Yeah. And the other bit we will focus on. So thank you everyone for attending today's session. Today's recording will be made available, will be on our website and I'll, and I'll send you um, today's um, presentation as well. And if you've got any question as well, I will let you, um, I will send um, Dr. Sigal's email, <laughs> email address. <laughs> I'll email his e um, email address to everyone as well. So if you've got any questions, you're more than happy to kind of um, send this to him directly. I hope you found today's session useful and beneficial. And thank you once again for attending today's session. And I think that is everything from